Hi everyone. So welcome to the stream today. Very much excited for having you once again on the stream. And uh, this week we're looking at uh, what I've entitled as the Executive Relation Masterclass. Very much excited about it because uh, last week we saw that we were doing a lot of things. We had a lot of uh, discussion on the various subjects and I took you through the various things 
that you need to look out for and consider when you are preparing for the various examination. So based on, so based on the results that uh, we got and the uh, kind of responses we got last week, I decided that, hey, I'm going to be extending this a little bit to assist you guys to be able to uh, prepare well for the examination. So this week, we are putting this whole week together and we're going to be going through various key aspects of the syllabus that you need to understand on the various subjects in various topics. And today we want to look at one of the fundamental topics in management accounting, and that is going to be relevance costing analysis. And so if you have any questions on whatever thing, welcome to the stream. I see you guys joining. Give us a thumbs up on the video. That way we get more engagement. And when we get more engagement like that, that is how YouTube is able to push the video to others to watch. And in case you've not subscribed to the channel also, do well to subscribe to the channel and become a VIP member. That way you will be able to get a notification for anything that we uh, do and you'll be able to also get support in relation to that. So like I mentioned, this is one of the fundamental uh, topics in management accounting that is relevant costing analysis. And it's very important for us to go through it and see what we need to do and the various factors that has to be taken into consideration when making these various uh, decisions. But the big question we ask ourselves is, what is relevant cost? And uh, why should this be a subject that we need to study or a topic that we need to study? Because definitely if you're writing the ICA, Introduction to Man Accounting Examination, or uh, management accounting in level two, or you're doing the ACCA, F2, F5, or you're writing the SEMA, definitely there is going to be a question on the relevant costing that you have to be able to understand and know how to do the treatment in relation to that. So why do we have to look at this? Why do we have to look at this? There are four key objectives that I want to achieve at the end of uh, this particular discussion. Number one is that at the end of this discussion, you should be able to understand the concept of relevant costing and its principle. So the first thing you have to take away is that at the end of this broadcast, you must understand what the concepts of relevant costing, not only the concept of relevant costing, as well as the principles that underline relevant costing. So that is the first objective I want to uh, make sure we achieve uh, today. Then number two, we need to be able to understand the importance of relevant costing. So aside understanding the concept, the second thing is the importance, also something that is critical that we need to understand. Then the third thing is to be able to also analyze how to determine relevant cost of material, relevant cost of labor, and relevant cost of uh, other element of cost. So determination of relevant cost. That is also something that we need to understand in relation to that. Then the fourth one, which is the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is for you to perform a special order pricing analysis using relevant costing. For you to be able to perform a special order pricing analysis using relevant costing. So these are the four key objectives that I want to make sure we achieve by the end of this discussion. One, you understand the concept of relevant costing and its principles. Number two, you should be able to understand and state the importance of relevant costing. Number three, you should be able to analyze how to determine the relevant cost of material, labor, and other elements of cost. And then number four, which is the most important aspect, which is where the examiner is going to be coming from, is to perform a special order pricing analysis using relevant costing principles in relation to that. So these are the things that you've got to be understanding on what we want to achieve uh, in the broadcast today. So that's my objective today. I see some comments uh, in the chat box. Uh, if you are watching, give us a thumbs up on the video and then share it as well with your colleagues on WhatsApp, on Facebook, 
let's get more people coming on board. So give us a thumbs up on the video. Augustine A. Boateng said, I guess everyone is doing great. Yes, Augustine, we are doing great. And I believe you are also doing well from the New York City. Then Richard A.J. said, okay, yes, please. All right, so I guess responding to Augustine's uh, statement. So comment below with any questions you have. Give us a thumbs up on the video, on the video, thumbs up on the video, and then let's get more engagement in relation to that. So the big question we ask ourselves is, why relevant costing? Why is it a topic that we need to look at? Now, to be able to answer that question on why it's a topic we need to consider, let me give you some background really quick. The first thing you must understand is this. So let's say you are an event organizing company, okay? So you are an event organizing company and an artist come to you and say, organize an event for us. So let's name an artist, let's say maybe Joe Mattel, or let's say Sarkodie comes and say, you should organize an event for him. Maybe let's say at the Independence Square, definitely after the coronavirus. How do you determine how much you would charge Joe Mattel or Sarkodie for the event as an event organizer? How do you determine how much you charge it? Remember, as an event organizer, you already have some chairs there that is going to be using chairs for the event. You have the stages, the stage, maybe the lighting, you have them there. The trusses, you have them there. You have the speakers that you may need. You have a DJ as well. You, and then you have maybe a model agency. So the ladies that will be dancing or the dancers, you have all of that there. The question is, how do you determine how much you charge? The, the, the another question is, when you are charging, will you take into consideration the chairs? Will you consider the stage, the lights? Will you consider the speakers you are using for the event? Will you consider the DJ? Will you consider the ladies for the dancing or the model agency? Will you consider them? So it is this kind of thing that brings about the issue of our relevant costing. Now, if you realize that uh, you're going to be considering all of these, you may end up saying that, oh, we're using our chairs, we're using our stages, we're using our speakers, we're using our DJ, we're using our dancers. For that reason, we will charge Joe Mattel uh, maybe uh, $100,000 for the event. Now, when you charge this $100,000 for the event, remember, another event organizing company, they will also speak to them. And that event organizing company may charge an amount below that of, let's say, um, $75,000. So do you think the artist will take the $100,000, your price, or the $75,000. Now you are gonna say me, tell me that it's right, it depends. But the artist will go to the $75,000. Why? Because the $75,000 business might have taken into consideration the relevant costing principle. So that is a special order. That is a job costing. That is a, an event we are undertaking. So when it comes to such event, when it comes to such contract, when it comes to such engagement, in order for us to determine the price at which we are going to be charging, we must first determine the cost we will be incurring on the event. The way we compute the cost to be incurred on the event is to use what is called the relevant costing principles. Meaning that we are going to be taking into consideration the relevant cost to be incurred in organizing the event and not bring all our costs into consideration. Another thing is, let's say you are a consultant and a company engages you or reaches out to you to do one or two things for them. How do you determine how much you charge the company? 
Do you charge the company, including your office, your stores, your computers? Do you take all that into consideration? The answer is no, you cannot do that. So in order for you to price at a profit, you must use the relevant costing principle. So if we need to use the relevant costing principle, then the question we ask ourselves is, what is relevant cost? What is relevant cost? In a simple language, we're gonna be defining a relevant cost So we would define relevant costs as future cash flows arising as a direct consequences of a decision. Let me take that again. Relevant costs are future cash flows arising as a direct consequence of a decision. So if we decide to organize the event, what are the future cash flows we're going to be incurring? So what are the cash flows that we'll be having, whether inflows or outflows, because we decided to organize the event? That is what we mean by relevant cost. So when we are dealing with the relevant cost and principles, we must ask ourselves, what is, it, what is relevant cost? What is irrelevant cost? So, sorry, so to start off, we must note a couple of things that constitute relevant cost. Now, from that one-liner definition that we gave, we can realize that relevant costs are, number one, future costs. So, number one, relevant costs are future costs. Number two, relevant costs are cash flows. So remember the definition, we said relevant costs are future cash flows arising as a direct consequence of a decision. So a relevant cost should be a future cost. It should be something that we are about to incur and not we have already, not that we have already incurred it. So number one, it should be a future cost. Number two, it must be a cash flow, meaning money should be going out or money should be coming in. Then the third thing we must note about relevant costs is that they are incremental costs. Relevant costs are incremental costs, meaning that they are costs that we are going to be incurring as an additional cost as a consequence of the decision that we are making in relation to that. So starting off of the bed, we must know that relevant costs are future costs, relevant costs are cash flows, and then relevant costs are incremental costs. So these are the three core features we can talk about when we discuss or when we are talking about relevant costs. All right. Okay, so I see a comment from uh, Augustine. Seydou Mohammed said, nice to meet you. Uh, you are welcome, nice to meet you too, Seydou. Augustine said, a relevant cost may also be defined as a cost appropriate to specific decision-making by management. Yes, that is true. So a cost appropriate to a specific decision making by management. So the cost, because of the specific decision that management is making, can also be defined as relevant cost. So if these are the features of relevant cost, then the question we ask ourselves is, what constitutes relevant cost? What constitutes relevant cost. So if we are making the relevant cost decision, if we are making the special order decision, what actually constitutes that particular cost? So let's look at what constitutes relevant cost. Number one is to talk about the issue in relation to variable cost. Variable cost. Now, what are variable costs? 
Variable costs are usually incurred based on the number of units to produce under the decision and the cost involved, or based on the activities to be undertaken and the cost involved. So if I'm going back to my illustration of the uh, event, then the DJ will be paying is a variable cost. Are you getting the idea? Uh, the modules we will be bringing to come and dance is a variable cost. Okay, so any cost we are incurring as a result of the way the thing is done, if it says we should uh, uh, bring in 15 ladies to dance on the stage, that means the variable cost to be paid to the ladies are going to what, increase. So one of the components of relevant cost is what? Variable cost, that's the starting point. But not only that, the second thing has to do with incremental cost. And I've explained this one already. So these are additional costs that we are incurring as a result of the decision that we are making in relation to that. Then the next thing is avoidable costs. Avoidable costs. So when we talk about avoidable costs, what are we saying? Avoidable costs simply are costs which the entity wouldn't have been cared had it not been for the decision. Avoidable costs are costs that the entity wouldn't have been cared if not for the decision. So for instance, specific fixed cost is an avoidable cost. Now, what is a specific fixed cost? Remember I told you for the event organizing, for example, we already have the stage there. So the cost of the stage is a sunk cost. And we'll look at that in a moment. It's a sunk cost. So we don't consider it when we are determining the cost of the event. I hope you are getting the idea. However, if the stage we have is not big, and the artist wants a bigger stage, then we're going to buy another stage as a result of undertaking that event becomes what is called what? the specific face cost. I believe you are getting the concept. So those kind of costs, those kind of face costs we are incurring because of this decision. Maybe we have cameras already. So the cost of the camera is a sunk cost. We won't consider it. However, the artist said he wants some aerial views in the, in the footage. So we need to go and buy drones. Then the drone that we are buying will become a specific face cost. And that is also an avoidable cost because had it not been for the event, we wouldn't have bought what? The, or we wouldn't have gone for or bought the drone in relation to that. So the third thing is avoidable cost. Then another thing we can talk about, which is my favorite area, which actually tricks students a lot, is what is called the opportunity cost. Opportunity cost. That is the fourth thing, opportunity cost. Now, when we talk about opportunity cost, what do we mean? Opportunity cost simply refers to the cost to be incurred as a result of stopping the production of a product or an activity to undertake a specific decision. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Uh, on the basic level, for those of you who did economics or who know about economics, we say that the opportunity cost is simply the ones for one in order to attain another. So remember I told you that we have the stage already. We have the chairs already. The apportionment of overheads on the chairs will not be included in determining the relevant cost or determining the cost to be incurred on the product, on the project. However, if we can rent out the chairs and make some money, that means if we use the chairs for this event, we wouldn't be able to rent it out. For that reason, that revenue we are losing by virtue of using the chairs for the event of the artist will become a lost revenue, and that is called an opportunity cost. I hope you are getting the illustration very well. Or maybe the labor we have, maybe the DJ we have, it's only one DJ we have, or maybe he's the best DJ we have. And the DJ is booked for an event, 
on that same day that this access is coming. Now, if the DJ leaves that event that he has booked for earlier before his time, we will pay a penalty of say 10,000 or maybe 1,000 Ghana cities. Now, we need that DJ for this particular artist because this is an A, uh, a listed artist. So if we let our DJ leave the other event before his time is due, then we have to pay a fine of how much? 1,000 Ghana cities. So that 1,000 Ghana cities we are paying by moving the DJ from the other event to this particular event is called what? Opportunity cost. I hope you are getting the concept here. That's very, very important. So when we talk about what should constitute relevant cost, we are talking about what? The variable cost. We are talking about the incremental cost. We are talking about the avoidable cost. And we are talking about what? The opportunity cost. This, these are the things that constitute the relevant cost. So when we are making any special order decision, any special order pricing analysis to determine how much cost we are going to be incurring so we can price as a, at a profit, these are the guiding principles. So if you are watching and you have any questions, you know what to do. Comment in the chat box with any questions you have. I'm reading your comments here and I will be replying to all of your comments. And then if you have not given us a thumbs up on the video, come on now, give us a thumbs up on the video. That way it gets more engagement and YouTube will be able to push it to other people as well. And if you have not subscribed to the channel, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit on the notification bell because uh, every single day, 4.30 p.m., I'll be coming your way like this and I'll be answering your questions and also be lecturing on various aspects. So make sure that you stay connected by subscribing to the channel as well. So if these are the relevant costs, what then are irrelevant costs? And I've given you some of them in relation to that. So let me wipe my notepad. So let's look at irrelevant cost or non-relevant cost. So I see a comment from Augustine. He said, so are you simply putting it that it is always the lost value or figure considered as the opportunity cost? Yes, the lost value or figure but it's not always a loss. That's what I'm telling you. If we are supposed to leave, rent the chairs and we use it for the event, then we can't rent it. So in that case, that lost revenue becomes the opportunity cost. However, if we are moving resources from one project to this specific project, and we are supposed to pay penalty for late delivery or penalty for cancellation, then that penalty or cancellation we are paying also becomes an opportunity cost in relation to that. So I guess that, that is the clarification on that. Okay, Pawili, I see you with a thumbs up in the uh, chat box. Thank you very much. So what constitutes irrelevant costs? I've mentioned them already, but let's go through them. The first one is called sunk cost sunk cost. Now, what is a sunk cost? In a simple language, we say that sunk cost is a cost incurred in the past, which does not affect the current decision. So for instance, the historical cost of the chairs, the chairs we bought is a sunk cost. The stages we bought is a sunk cost. Our speakers will be a sunk cost, okay? So any cost we've incurred in the past, the historical cost of the asset, the book value of the asset, it's a sunk cost. We don't consider it when we are making special order pricing analysis. Number two, committed cost. I love this one. So what is committed cost? What is committed cost? 
Committed cost is also a cost that has been incurred in the past as a result of an agreement by the a decision by the entity, which doesn't have, affect the current event or the current decision. So, example of committed cost can be, for instance, like uh, I said, we are an event organizing company. So let's say we've signed a contract with a module agency who give us uh, the dances, or I don't know, yes. So they provide us with the dances for the artists. What it means is that we've already signed that contract with them. We have paid the money already. So whether we organize the event or we don't organize the event, whether they bring the girls or they don't bring the girls, we will still pay or we have already paid them what they are fee. So that is called committed cost. I hope you are getting the idea. So committed costs are also irrelevant costs. Then the next thing is to talk about non-cash flows. Remember I told you relevant costs are cash flows. So non-cash flows, such as depreciation, amortization, they are irrelevant costs. So when you are making any relevant costing decisions, non-cash items, depreciation, amortization, provisions, they are irrelevant costs because they are non-cash items and are not considered in the making of the decision. Then the last thing I would want to add is fixed overheads absorbed. So absorption of fixed overheads is also irrelevant cost. Absorption of fixed overhead is also irrelevant cost. Remember, specific overheads like electricity bill, okay, like supervisors for the job may be, may be relevant, but fixed overheads that we are absorbing, like for instance, so today I'm, I'm actually shooting from one of our lecture halls here. So if like uh, there is something we want to do here and so we are charging people for it, the rent for those premises has been paid already. And whether we undertake the event or organize lectures or not, it has been paid already. For that reason, we can't absorb the rent into the special order we've received into the requirements we've received. So absorption of fixed overhead is not what a relevant cost in relation to that. So all of these things are irrelevant costs. Sunk cost, cost you've incurred in the past. Committed cost, cost you've incurred in the past as a result of a contract you've signed. Non-cash items, depreciation, amortization, provisions. These are all irrelevant cash flows and then fixed overhead absorbed are also irrelevant cash flows. So this is what you have to understand when it comes to uh, determining the relevant cost and irrelevant cost. So I see a comment from Damilari Olawabi. He said, greetings from Nigeria, sir. Greetings, I believe you are doing well. And uh, I guess you guys have your band lifted also in Nigeria, I don't know. And so I believe you are doing well and taking care of us all. Right. So now we've distinguished between what is relevant cost and what is irrelevant cost. So let's now take the items one after the other and let's ask ourselves a couple of questions. Number one, how do we determine the relevant cost of material. Number two, how do we determine the relevant cost of labor? Okay, these are the two core questions we need to answer right now. Now, if you are watching, comment in the chat box with any questions you have. I'm reading your comments live and I'll be responding to them uh, in relation to that. So comment below in the chat box and give us a thumbs up as well on the video so we get more engagement so YouTube can push the video into the into other to other viewers okay to other viewers so let's look at determination of relevant cost of material okay uh, augustine said 
would notional cost come under fixed overhead cost? Yeah, definitely, because notional costs are not the actual cost we are incurring. So they will definitely come under, we, we may not bring them directly under fixed overhead, but notional costs are uh, irrelevant because it's not the real cost we are incurring, it's just uh, a cost that is coming up in relation to that. So we will describe it as an irrelevant cost in relation to that. So let's look at how we determine the relevant cost of material. Now, this is where the journey begins. So you have to make sure you follow me carefully. So how do we determine the relevant cost of material? In the determination of relevant cost of material, I'm going to give you a guide. And that guide entails three key questions. So we're gonna be asking ourselves these questions and what I want you to do is that have these questions at the back of your mind. Know them off head, okay? Management accounting, one of the things you must understand is that there are principles and you can't chew this principle by back, understand the concept. Once you understand the concept, you everywhere you go, you will be able to apply it in relation to that. So when we are determining the relevant cost of material, we ask ourselves a couple of questions. Number one, the first question we ask ourselves is this. So question one, is it in stock? So that's the first question we ask ourselves. The material we need for the job, the materials we need for the job, is it already in stock? So let's say we are uh, producing or we are, uh, maybe I'm a tailor and uh, you come to me to sew a dress for you and you say you want within, okay? You want within and I will ask, do I already have the within in stock or maybe you want GTP or whatever material you want? I have to ask myself, do I already have it in stock? This question will come with two answers. No, I don't have it in stock. Yes, I have it in stock. Be careful here. Remember I told you we are starting. So if it is no, I don't already have the materials in stock or we don't already have the materials in stock, then the relevant cost will be what? The purchases price. So relevant cost is the purchases price. So we want a material or you want a material for your dress. I don't have it in stock. So what do I have to do? If I need to sew your dress for you, I've got to go and get it. So the relevant cost, when we don't already have the material in stock, is the purchases price. But if the answer is yes, we have the materials in stock, then we have to ask ourselves another question. And so that leads us to question two. And what is this question two about? This question two is that, is it in constant use? Is it in constant use? So that is the second question we ask ourselves if the material is already in stock. Is it in constant use? In other words, is this a material that we use almost every day or is a material that is there that we aren't using? This question will also bring two answers, as always. Yes, it is in constant use. No, it is not in constant use. Yes, it is in constant use. No, it is not in constant use. Now, if the material is in constant use, then if I use it for this job, what do I have to do? I need to replace it. Okay, if the material is in constant use, 
Then if I use it for this job, what do I have to do? I need to replace it. For that reason, if the material is in constant use, then the relevant cost is the replacement cost. So the relevant cost is the replacement cost. So if the material is in stock and it is in constant use, then the relevant cost is what? The replacement cost. Because if I use it for this job, I need to replace it. So let's start over again. When it comes to determination or analyzing the relevant cost of material, the first question we ask ourselves is, is it in stock? If it is in stock, is it in stock? We can get to answer it. Yes, it is in stock. No, it is not in stock. If it is not in stock, then we need to go and buy it for this job. For that reason, the relevant cost is the purchase's price. But if the answer is yes, it is in stock, we don't end there. What do we do? We ask ourselves the second question, which is, is it in constant use? This one also can bring two questions, sorry, two answers. Yes, it is in constant use. No, it is not in constant use. So if yes, it is in constant use, that means if we use it for this job, what do we have to do? We need to replace it. For that reason, if the material is in constant use, that means the relevant cost is the replacement cost. Very, very important. Now, if the material is not in constant use, that means we are getting a no, it is not in constant use, then we have to ask ourselves the third and final question. So question three, when the relevant cost, sorry, when the material is not in constant use, the question three is going to be, is there an alternative use? Is there an alternative use? Is there an alternative use? That's the question, the third question we ask. Is there an alternative use? Why is this question important? Because we have stated that the material is not in constant use. Okay, can we use it for something else? Can we use it for something else? If yes, there is an alternative use. So two answers can come here as well. Yes, there is an alternative use. No. There is no alternative use. Now, if yes, there is an alternative use, that means if we use it for this job, we cannot use it for the other job. In that case, we will say that our relevant cost will, will become what? The opportunity cost. I hope you are seeing the way we are getting the analysis done. The opportunity cost. So the relevant cost is the opportunity cost. So if there is an alternative use, if the material can be used for something else, or the materials can be sold, maybe it cannot be used for anything else, but it can be sold. That means if we use it for this job, we will be losing that contribution. We will be losing that sales. For that reason, the opportunity cost will become, sorry, the opportunity cost, yes, becomes the relevant cost. But if the answer is no, which means it has no use, follow me carefully here. If it has no use, then our relevant cost is zero. zero. So if no, the relevant cost is nil. Agree? Because there is no alternative use. We use it for this 
or we will use it for anything else. Then the relevant cost is what? Nil. But this is the sweet spot. There are some times when if a material has no use in an organization, the organization must dispose it off. Now, in order for the organization to dispose it off, the organization will incur a cost. So if the company will incur a cost in the disposal of the material, then the relevant cost in that case will become what? The disposal cost. Are you getting the principle here? Very, very important. So if the entity has to incur a cost in disposing of the material, then the relevant cost will be the disposal cost. But the good news here is that what it means is that should we use it for this project, we are actually saving ourselves that disposal cost. It means we won't pay that again. For that reason, that will be a reduction to the cost that we are charging the party that we are engaging in relation to that. This is the analysis you must have at the back of your mind when dealing with relevant cost of material. Any questions, please put them in the comment box or the chat box, and I'm gonna be answering all of them for you. And give us a thumbs up as well on the video, that way we get more engagement on the video as well. So any questions about material or about anything so far, put it in the comment box or the chat box. I'm gonna read all your comments for you. I believe you are following the principles very, very well. So that's how we determine the relevant cost of material. So let's go to the brother of material and that's labor. How do we determine relevant cost of labor? How do we do that? So let's go. So how do we determine the relevant cost of labor? In the determination of the relevant cost of labor also, we go through the question analysis like I did for you in the material cost. But this time around, we will ask ourselves the following questions. So question one, are employees permanently employed? Are employees permanently, are employees permanently employed? So our labor force, the people we need to do this job, are they permanently employed? That's the first question we ask ourselves. The labor force we need for this job, are they permanently employed? Two answers can come as always. And that is, no, they aren't permanently employed. Yes they are permanently employed. Okay, if no, they aren't permanently employed, that means when we bring them on this job, we gotta pay them their hourly rates. True or false? True, right? So if they aren't permanently employed, then our relevant cost is the hourly rate we're gonna be paying them. So if no, they aren't permanently employed, then the relevant cost is the hourly rate because we don't already have them. We are not already paying them. So anytime we need them, we have to pay them their hourly rate. And that is the relevant cost. But if the answer is yes, that is our employees or the employees are permanently employed, then we go to the second question and ask ourselves, the question number two. The question number two is, is there an ideal time? Is there an ideal time 
I believe you know what is an ideal time. Ideal time is where labor is being paid and not uh, labor is being paid and not working. Okay, so there are times when people are permanently employed and there is no job. And what do you do? You'll be watching YouTube videos. You'll be doing WhatsApp chats. So do we have anything like that? Now, I see a comment from Augustine. Based on your chart so far, it concludes that any cause that does not fulfill the conditions of relevant cause is considered non-relevant. Yes, that's true. That's true. Thank you, Augustine. That, that's true. So is there an ideal time? Two answers as always, right? Yes, there is an ideal time. Nope, there is no ideal time. So two answers can always pop up. Yes, there is an ideal time. No, there is no ideal time. Now, if the people are permanently employed and there is an ideal time, that is, there is a time where they are not doing anything. You are already paying them their salaries. Then we will say that the relevant cost is what? Nil. That's a good news. So relevant cost is nil. So if labor is permanently employed and there is spare capacity, there is ideal time, then the relevant cost is going to be what? Nil. I hope you are getting the concept here. Because I've already employed you guys. You are on a fixed salary. There is a time you are not doing anything. All you are doing is watching YouTube videos, watching telenovelas, doing WhatsApp and other things. Okay, now that you are not doing anything, you will be doing the new contract. So the relevant cost there, if the ideal time is there, is going to be nil. But there are times where our labor force is fully utilized. It means there is no ideal time. So if the, there is no ideal time, then we have to ask ourselves question number three. So let's go through again. Question number one, are employees permanently employed? No, they aren't permanently employed. If they aren't permanently employed, then the relevant cost is the hourly rate we pay, should we employ them? If yes, they are permanently employed, then we ask ourselves the next question. That is, is there an ideal time? Is there a spare capacity or is ideal time available? Yes, there is an ideal time. Yes, there is a spare capacity. In that case, we say that the relevant cost is zero, is nil, because we will not pay anything. These people are already our employees. But if labor is fully utilized, labor is fully occupied, that means ideal time is not available. So there is no ideal time. In that case, we ask ourselves the question number three, which is the last question. So question number three, and that is gonna be, is overtime possible? So question three, is overtime possible? Is overtime possible? So that is the final, the third and final question about labor. Is overtime possible? Okay, our employees are fully utilized, isn't it? They don't have a spare time, but can they do overtime? If they can do overtime, yes. So again, two answers. Yes, overtime is possible. No, overtime is not possible. So if yes, they can do an overtime, then what is the relevant cost? In that case, our relevant cost will be the basic wage that we're gonna be paying them plus the overtime premium. Plus the overtime premium. So they can do overtime. Our workforce, they love us. They love working. So they said, okay, we are supposed to close at 6 p.m. But because of this contract, 
we are ready to work for an extra five hours or three hours every day. So over time it's possible. In that case, we will pay them their basic salary based on the hours they are working. Then because they are working overtime, what do we do? We pay them an overtime premium. But there are sometimes staff will be exhausted. They will say, hey, Inshira, we ain't gonna do any overtime for you guys. We are tired. We are not gonna do it. So in that case where overtime is not possible, what is the relevant cost there? So here we have two options. If the overtime is not possible, the first option is that we can directly outsource and bring in new staff to come and do the job. If we outsource, bring in new staff to come and do the job, then the relevant cost will be what? The hourly rates we are paying them. Are you getting the concept? Then the relevant cost will be the hourly rates that we are paying them. So overtime is not possible, but we need to do the job. What do we do? We employ new people and we are going to be paying them what? The hourly rate. So this one goes back to the very first question, more or less like the people are not employed. So we need to pay them the hourly rate. But a second option is for us to uh, move the employees from an existing job to the new contract. Okay, so movement of the employees from an existing job to a new job. In that case, when we move them from an existing job to the new job, what is gonna happen there? It means in that case, we will say that the relevant cost is going to be the opportunity cost. Does it make sense? The relevant cost is going to be the opportunity cost. Why is that? Simple, because when we move them from the job they are doing now to the new job, we may lose revenue. We may lose contribution. For that reason, there is an opportunity cost there in relation to that. But remember, as we move them from the job they are doing to the new job, we still have to pay them their basic salary. So the relevant cost here being the opportunity cost actually includes the lost contribution plus their basic salary. The lost contribution plus their basic salary. These are the things that you have to understand when we talk about the issue in relation to identification of relevant cost of material. So comment below with any questions that you have and I'm gonna be answering all of them. Right, so any questions for me? Any questions for me? Put them in the comment box, uh, in the chat box. I'm reading all of your comments and I'll be answering all of them. So I believe you understand the principle or the determination of uh, relevant cost for material and then relevant cost for labor. So now that we've gotten the basics out of the way, 
Let's look at some practical questions, isn't it? Let's look at how we can solve a couple of questions in relevant costing and uh, make the relevant costing decision. So let me share my screen with you. So I could. So let me share my screen with you. Okay, so I believe you can see my question on the screen and you can, I'm gonna give you some two minutes for you to scribble this question down and we're gonna be solving that for the material. So example one, relevant cost of material. Let me zoom out a little bit. Okay. So you can scribble this down real quick and let's continue. So a company is making a new product which requires several types of material. And this is the detail of the table for the materials. So you can put the table down. I'm giving you some few minutes to put it down. The requirement is what is the relevant cost of materials required for manufacturing the new products? So you can put the table down real quick and then let's answer them one after the other. So as you are writing, I'll be reading through it in relation to that. So for material A, now in the table we have four columns and we have the material column we have the units in inventory. We have the units required. That means the units we need for the job. And then we have the additional information in relation to that. Then we have additional information. Now, look at material A closely. For material A, for this new job, we need 40 units. But there is none in inventory. If you remember our principles, we said, if the inventory is not already in stock, then the relevant cost will be what? The purchase's price. For that reason, when it comes to determination of the relevant cost of material A, we will just multiply the 40 by the seven and that will give us the material or the relevant cost of material A. So grabbing my Casio calculator here. And then material B. For material B, we need 100, all right? But the 100 we need we already have, sorry, we need 150, but we already have 100 in stock. Now the 150 that we need, we already have 100. And that 100 was bought at a price of $10 per unit. Remember I told you that the cost price of the acquisition of inventory, the cost price for the acquisition of material or, or fixed pro, uh, assets is a sum cost. So in this case, that $10 per unit of the materials already in stock is a sunk cost. It will even come into the discussion. But we need 150. We have 100 in stock. Let's look at additional information on that. Current purchase price is $14 per unit. The materials has no use in the company other than for the project under consideration. So look at it. 
Is the material in stock? Yes. Is it in constant use? No. Does it have an alternative use? Yes. Are you getting the concept here? So you realize that the, the handheld is in stock, but it has no use. But does it have an alternative use? We are told that units in inventory can be sold for $12 per unit. So since that handbag has no alternative use, but can be sold at $12 per unit, it means if we use it for this job, we will not get the sales revenue. For that reason, the handbag will be taken at 12, which means the opportunity cost, and then the extra material cost will be the 50 that we need, and that will be bought at $14 per unit. I hope you are getting the explanation. We're going to be solving all that. You are writing, so I'm taking my time as well to explain the concepts for you. Then, material C. Now, for material C, we need 120 uh, units, but we already have 50 units in stock, and I want you to follow this carefully. We need 120, but we have 50 in stock. Again, this 50 was bought at $20 per unit. Remember the price at which the material was bought is a sunk cost. So that $20 per unit, we're not going to be considering it. It's a sunk cost. But let's look at the additional information. We are told that current purchase price is $22 per unit. Current purchase price is $22 per unit. The material is regularly used in current manufacturing operations. So is it in stock? Yes. Is it in constant use? Yes. Now, if the material is in a regular use in current manufacturing operation of the company, then when we use the 50 in inventory, what do we have to do? We must buy it and replace it. So when the materials are in constant use, we say that the relevant cost will be the replacement cost. So that 50, should we use it, we will buy it or we will replace it at $22. Then the extra 70 we need, we will also buy it at $22. So it means technically we are buying the entire 120 at $22 in relation to that. So this is how we determine the relevant cost of these three material. Material A, there was nothing in stock, so the purchases price becomes a relevant cost. Material B, there were some in stock, but it can also be, it, it is not in constant use though, but it can be sold. So the lost contribution, the lost sales revenue becomes the opportunity cost, then the extra will be bought. The material C, we have some in stock, but it is in constant use. For that reason, the relevant cost will be what? The replacement cost of that 50, which is already in inventory that we need to use in relation to that. So I believe you have finished writing. The requirement is, what is the relevant cost of the materials required for manufacturing or for manufacture of the new product? So let's see. So I'm going to be stop. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, and I'll move to my notes part. Okay. So, question one: relevant cost of material A. So material A, like we need 40, there is none in inventory. So what do we do? We buy it outright. So in that case, we say the relevant cost is going to be the 40 units we need at $7 per unit. And that's going to give us 40 by 7, 4728, so 
eighty dollars. So that is the relevant cost of material A. Then we come to material B. The material B, we need 150, but we already have 100 in stock. That 100 which is in stock is not in constant use. Does it have any use? But that 100 already in stock can be sold for $12 per unit. For that reason, we, there is an opportunity cost there. So for the material B, the first thing we bring is the, the lost uh, revenue. So opportunity cost. And that is gonna be the 100 in inventory times $12 per unit. Then the extra cost we're gonna be incurring, which is the 50, and that one we need to buy it at the current purchases price of $14. So in this case, 100 by 12 will be 12,200. And then 50 by 14, that will be 700. So when we sum it up, the relevant cost of material B is going to be 1,900. So that is how we determine the relevant cost of material A and then relevant cost of material B. So I'm gonna give you some few minutes to scribble it down, then we go to the material C. If you have any questions, I see you guys. If you have any questions, put it in the chat box. Uh, I'm going to be answering all of them or put it in the comment box. I'm gonna be answering all of them in relation to that. And give us a thumbs up on the video as well, okay? Give us a thumbs up on the video. That way we get more engagement on the video and more people will be able to uh, YouTube will be able to push it uh, to more people to watch so that we can grow the channel. And if you have not subscribed to the channel also, come on now, hit the subscribe button and then the notification bell so that when I go live like this, you'll be the first person to be notified. And when we do other uh, uh, giveaways as well also, you will be part of it in relation to that. So material cost, for A and B. So let's go to the material C. From our question, we saw that when it comes to the material C, we need 120, but there is 50 already in stock. But because the materials are in constant use, that 50 in stock, should we use it, we must replace it. So the relevant cost for the 50 will be the replacement cost then the extra 70 we need will also be bought at the current price in relation to that. So let's go to material C. So material C. So when it comes to material C, two things. There's going to be, the relevant cost is going to entail the replacement cost for the 50 inventory, which is going to be the 50 by 22. And then the extra material that we need. And that's going to be 70 also by 22. So 50 by 22, that's the replacement of the one in stock, 1,100. And then 70 by 22, that's 1,540. So when we add it up, we get 2,640 dollars. So that is the relevant cost uh, of material in relation to that. Augustine said, please, I'm on the train. I couldn't pick all the questions. 
Okay. So I'm, I will reshare again. Then maybe you can do a screenshot of it, Augustine. So this is the relevant cost of uh, material C. So it was 120. We already had 50 in stock, but it is in a regular use or is in constant use. For that reason, if we use it, we have to replace it. So the relevant cost will be the 50 being replaced in relation to that, and then the extra that we are going to be incurring in that case. So you can take a screenshot of your phone of this, and then let me share the question again so you can see. So this is the question again. So you can take a screenshot of it. All right, so I've got, I hope you got it now. So that is how we determine the relevant cost of material using these questions. So let's go to another question where we can look at relevant cost of labor. So once you have your, your phone with you, you can take a snapshot of the screen so that it will be easy on you, then you can write it out later on. Now, example two, so relevant cost of labor. A company has a new product, sorry, a company has a new project which requires the following three types of labor. Okay, so Augustine said, thanks, I got it, all right. So relevant cost of labor, we see that the company has a new project which requires the following three types of labor. So there are three types of labor here, unskilled labor, semi-skilled labor, and then skilled labor. So let's see what we have here. So we see three columns here, the labor type, hours required, and additional information. So let's see what's happening there. When it comes to the unskilled labor, we are told we need 12,000 hours. But look at the additional information. The 12,000 hours paid at $8 per hour and existing staff are fully utilized. The company will hire new staff to meet this additional demand. So let's get it. When it comes to labor, I told you that we asked ourselves three questions. Number one, are they permanently employed? From this question, yes, they are permanently employed. Is, ideal time, is there an ideal time? As we can see, no, there is no ideal time. And I told you that if there is no ideal time, either we can ask our existing staff to do uh, an overtime or we outsource the job. So as you can see in this question, we are told that our staff are fully utilized, existing staff are fully utilized, and so the company will have to hire. So if we are hiring new staff for this new job, what do we do? We simply have to pay them at $8 per hour. So when it comes to this unskilled labor, the relevant cost is going to be what? The 12,000 hours multiply by $8 per hour because the whole 12,000 hours will be outsourced to the new staff. 
I hope you are getting the principle. Then ne next one, semi-skilled. Semi-skilled, very, very important. Semi-skilled. For the semi-skilled, we need 2,000 hours. We need 2,000 hours. So if we need 2,000 hours, it is paid at $12 per hour. That's the additional information. These employees are difficult to recruit and the company retains a number of permanently employed staff. So question one, are they permanently employed? From the question, yes. If they are permanently employed, the next question we ask ourselves is, is overtime, sorry, is ideal time, is there an ideal time or is there spare capacity? Let's build up the question. There is currently 800 hours of ideal time available and any additional hours would be fulfilled by temporary staff that will be paid at $14 per hour. So what's happening here? We need 2,000 hours, but thank God, our existing staff have 800 hours ideal time. We've already paid them permanently, but they aren't working during those 800 hours. What means is that the cost of the 800 hours will be sunk cost because it's ideal time. So the extra hours we need, the additional hours we need, which is 2,000 minus 800, which will be 1,200 hours, will be the relevant cost, and that will be multiplied by the $14 per hour. I believe you are getting the principles. <coughs> Sorry. Then let's look at the third one, skilled labor. For the skilled labor, we need 8,000 hours. And I want you to be careful about this. You see, one of the things I tell you guys all the time when it comes to management accounting is that in other words, if your English is not good, you're going to struggle here. Now, when we talk about English being good, we are not talking about the preparatory school English. We are talking about management accounting English, your ability to read the statement and understand what is happening in the statement. So make sure you read through the lines very well. That is why in management accounting examination, F2, F5, or management accounting examination, students fail because they don't read the question properly. So make sure you leave no stone on 10 and you read everything well. So let's look at the skilled labor. The reason why I just emphasize that is that the skilled labor has something there that you must understand. So when it comes to the skilled labor, we need 8,000 hours paid at one, sorry, $15 per hour. There is a severe shortage of employees with these skills. And the only way that this labor can be provided for the new project will be for the company to move employees away from making product X. Immediately you hear that something has to click. I don't know if it clicked for you. Are they permanently employed? Yes. Is there spare capacity or ideal time? No. Can they do overtime? No. So the only option available to the organization, when, when it comes to the skilled labor, because of their scarcity, we need to move them from an existing job to this job. Remember I told you when you move an employee from one job to another, the relevant cost is going to be what? The opportunity cost, which will include their basic salary that you are going to give them plus the lost contribution or the lost sales. Very, very important. So let's see what's happening there. A unit of product X takes four hours to make and makes a contribution of $24 per unit. So we need 8,000 hours. When we take these guys from this job, that job takes four hours to make and we make $24 per unit. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, what is the lost contribution per hour? So the lost contribution per hour 
will be 24 over four. And that is going to be what? $6. So the loss contribution per R is going to be $6. So we multiply the $6 by the 8,000 and that will give us the loss contribution. Then, like I told you, we are moving them from an existing job to this new job. For that reason, we need to pay them their basic salary. So their basic salary will also be 8,000 hours multiplied by um, $15 per hour. That is how we determine the relevant cost also of the skilled labor. I believe you are getting the understanding. Comment in the chat box if you have any questions in relation to that and give us a thumbs up on the video if you have not given us a thumbs up on it. Now, I explained these things because I wanted it to capture the question or scribble it down. So now that we have the questions, let's go to my notepad and let's solve. Give me a moment. My mind file is going low. Okay, so let's go. So in a First example on skilled labor. So on skilled labor. Our relevant cost will be, we are told that we need 12,000 hours and they are paid at $8 per hour. Existing staffs are fully utilized. So the company will need to hire new staffs. So when it comes to the unskilled labor, our relevant cost is going to be, we just put it into bracket, the 12,000 hours multiplied by $8 per hour. So 12,864, that's gonna be Okay, 12,896, so 9,600 rather. So that is the relevant cost for the unskilled labor, 9,600 in relation. Uh, will it be 9,600 or 96,000? 12,000 by eight, 96,000, not 9,600. So that is 6,000. So this is the relevant cost for the unskilled labor. Let's come to the semi-skilled. So when it comes to the semi-skilled, we are told we need 2,000 hours, but there is an ideal time of 800. And we are told that the additional hours will be fulfilled by the temporary staff and we'll pay them at $14 per hour. So since there is an ideal time of 800, that will not come in. So when it comes to the semi-skilled, our relevant cost will be the extra hours we need, which is the 1,200, because 2,000 minus 800 is 1,002, and this will be paid at $14 per hour. So 1,200 by 14 per hour, and that's 16,800. So that is also the relevant cost of um, semi-skill. I believe you're getting the principle. So the unskilled labor, we got the idea there. Uh, the semi-skill, we got the answer. Now let's come to the skilled labor. Remember what we said under the skilled labor, we need 8,000 hours, but the labor is scarce. And so we need to move them from one job to another job. So the relevant cost is going to be the opportunity cost, which is going to include 
their basic salary, and then the lost contribution on the new job in relation to that. So let's look at the skilled labor also. So skilled labor. So before we even go to the computation, let's calculate the loss contribution per hour. Or we can just say contribution per hour. And that's gonna be $24 per unit divided by four hours. And so that is going to be $6. So contribution per hour is going to be $6. So using that understanding, what do we do? We bring their basic salary or basic wage, which is going to be 8,000 hours, multiplying the rate of $15, and then We'll bring the lost contribution, which is still 8,000 hours times $6 per hour, because we've calculated the contribution per hour above here as $6 per unit. So now that we have that, we multiply them up to get a relevant cost. So we're going to have 8,000 by 15, and that's going to be 120,000. And then 8,000 by 6, it's 628. 48, okay. So 8,000 by 6, 48,000. So when we add the two up, we're going to get 140, $168,000. dollars And that becomes the relevant cost of the skilled labor. So I believe you are getting the principles now on how we are determining the relevant cost of the skilled labor and the relevant cost for the unskilled labor and the relevant cost of the semi-skilled labor. Remember, all the things we are doing <clears throat> is based on the statements made in the question. So it is the statement made in the question that is guiding us on what we need to do in relation to that. So any questions, please put it in the chat box, put it in the comment box. I see you guys watching. Thank you very much. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat box. I'm reading your comments and I'll be replying to them in relation to that. And if you have not subscribed to the channel also, make sure you subscribe to the channel because we'll be doing, we're gonna be doing this thing over and over again. And as long as we need to do it, for you to be able to prepare well for your examination and understand these concepts today. Okay, so Damilari Uwulabi said, said, for the semi-skill, I thought the relevant cost is the 800 hours ideal time at 14. No, the 800 hours is ideal time, Damilari. Uh, the 800 is ideal time, so it's irrelevant. We've employed the people permanently, and there is 800 hours that they aren't working. So the relevant cost will be the extra or the additional hours that we need. That is why it is, it is going to be 1,002 by the 14. So the 800 there, it's irrelevant. But we will subtract that from the total hours we need so that the additional hours of 1,002 will be paid at $14 per unit. So Damilari, I believe you understand. Let me know if it is clearer now for you.
Okay. So let's look at another question, still on the relevant costing uh, uh, analysis or principle. Let's look at another question. Okay, Damilari said it's clear, but can I explain the skill again? So the skilled labor, what I said was that we need 8,000 hours, all right? Is it 8,000 hours? Let me go there to see. Yeah, 8,000 hours. But this kind of labor is scarce. And so for us to be able to do the job, the new order, we need to move them from an existing work. Now. If you move me from the job that I'm already doing here to another job and you have not permanently employed me, then you have to pay me my basic salary because if I'm not working, you aren't paying me. For that reason, when we move them from making of product X to this new project, we are going to be paying them what? Their basic salary. So their basic salary will be $15 per hour times the $8,000. However, because we are moving them from an existing job to this project, we are losing a contribution. And we are told that the contribution is $24 per unit. And each unit of product X, it requires four hours or need four hours. So we calculate the contribution per hour. So the loss contribution per hour, that's gonna be the $24 divided by four. And that gives us six dollars. Then we multiply that six dollars per hour by the number of hours that they will be leaving the product X. And that is, we add the two results, and that gives us the relevant cost in relation to that. So, Damilari, let me know if the skill labor is clearer now for you. So if you are watching and you have any questions, put them in the chat box. I'll be answering all of your questions for you. So let's look at another question here. And this one is relevant cost of material. So how do we determine <clears throat> the relevant cost of material. So we are told here that some years ago, a company bought a piece of machinery for $300,000. So a company bought a piece of machinery for $300,000. Remember, the cost at which they bought the machine is a sunk cost. So we are not going to be considering it. I believe it makes sense. So it's a sum cost. We are not going to be considering it. Then we are told that the net book value of the machine is currently $50,000. Again, the net book value of the machine is also not our concern. So that is also irrelevant when we are making any decision about the machine. Next, the company could spend $100,000 on updating the machine and the products subsequently made on it could generate a contribution of $150,000. So we can update the machine to incur a cost of $100,000.
So that hundred thousand dollars is what an incremental cost. So since it's an incremental cost, since it's a future cost, it is relevant. So the cost to be incurred to upgrade the machine is hundred thousand dollars. Then we are told that if we upgrade the machine subsequently, we will generate a contribution of one hundred fifty thousand. So that contribution we are generating also is a relevant. Uh, cost item because it's a cash flow in relation to that, just that it's, a, it's an inflow here. The machine could be or would be depreciated at $25,000 per annum. Remember when we are dealing with relevant cost, depreciation is a non-cash item, so it's irrelevant. So the historical cost is irrelevant, the net book value is irrelevant, the depreciation is also irrelevant. But we are told that, alternatively, if the, comp if the machine is not updated, the company could sell it now for $75,000. Then look at the requirements of the question. On a relevant cost basis, should the company update and use the machine or sell it now? Should the company update and use the machine or sell it now? So that is the question we are confronted with. And what do we do? So like I told you, the historical cost of 300,000, irrelevant. We will consider it. The net book value of 50,000, irrelevant. We will not consider it. The depreciation every year, $25,000, irrelevant. We will not consider it. However, we are told there are two choices here that a company can make. The first choice is that they can upgrade the machine. Now, the cost of upgrade, we are told is what? $100,000. So that is a relevant cost. Then we are told when they upgrade, they will make a revenue or a contribution of 150,000. So we need to get a net benefit if the machine is upgraded. Now the net benefit if the machine is upgraded will be the contribution minus the cost to be incurred. So 150,000 minus 100,000. So the net benefit is going to be what? 50,000. But we are told that should the entity decide not to upgrade, it can sell the machine right now at 75,000. So the question here is, should they sell the machine now and get $75,000 or upgrade the machine in carrying a cost of $100,000 and making a contribution of $150,000, giving a net benefit of $50,000? If you see, you realize that when we sell it, we'll get $75,000, but when we upgrade, we are getting a net benefit of $50,000. For that reason, the higher, the better. Hence, the company should sell the machine right now and make a $75,000 in relation to that. This is how we answer this question. So let's put the pieces together on my notepad. So two decisions here. Decision A is to upgrade and use the system. Decision B is to sell now. So when we upgrade, what are we saying? We are going to get a contribution of $150,000 but we will incur a cost of $100,000. So the net benefit will be $50,000, right? But when we sell it now, how much are we going to get? We'll get $75,000. So you realize that the sell it now 
or the $75,000 is greater than the $50,000. For that reason, the decision is that, therefore, the entity should sell the machine now. That is the answer to the question. That is the answer to the question. Okay, so I see a thumbs up from Richard and Jay. Okay, so I guess you understand in relation to that. So this is how we determine the relevant cost of the material, sorry, the machinery. Remember, the price at which we bought it some time ago is irrelevant. It's a sunk cost. Number two, the book value or the carrying amount of the asset is also irrelevant. Depreciation, also irrelevant. So the relevant issue will be the future contribution we're gonna be having, 150,000, the cost to be incurred on the upgrade, 100,000, and then if we decide to sell it right now. So, As we can see, should we sell it now, we are making 75,000. Should we upgrade, we are making a net benefit of 50,000. So if I were you or you were me, what will you do? You will sell it now because when you sell it now, you will make $75,000. This is the concept about uh, relevant costing analysis in relation to that. So any questions, please put them in the chat box or the comment box for me. If you have any questions, I'm gonna be answering all of your questions for you. So put them in the chat box or in the comment box for me. If you have any question, I'm going to be concluding around here for today. And uh, God willing next week, possibly we would have to continue next week because there is a question a standard relevant costing question that we need to solve, which is a full question in that case that we need to solve. And so possibly tomorrow we can solve that and then we'll look at some other thing else as well, still in management accounting in relation to that. Because I need to solve the standard question with you because that is where you can now put the pieces together and see the rationale in total behind what we have discussed so far in relation to that. So any questions for me? Any questions for me? Put them in the chat box. Richard said, please, can you explain the skilled again? Okay. So the skilled labor, we said that the company needed 8,000 hours but the employees are scarce and they are currently working on a job. Now, since the employees are scarce, we can't outsource the job because we cannot get anybody else. However, if we decide to move our employees who are working already on a job, if we decide to move them to the new job, we'll be losing a contribution and the product X that they are producing requires four hours per unit to make. If we bring them to this job, we'll be losing $24 per unit. So the question is, what is the loss contribution per hour? So the loss contribution per hour, it's going to be, okay. I guess Richard said, thanks, got it, all right. All right, all right. So I just have to stop explaining then. Any questions, any questions, any questions? Relevant costing analysis, a very, very critical topic in relation to that. Possibly, like I mentioned, tomorrow we would have to continue with this and then look at uh, the standard question that we have to look at in relation to this particular uh, topic in relation to that, <clears throat> and then maybe touch on something else in that case. So if you are watching, 
comments below with any questions you have for me. And uh, I will be signing out around here any moment from now in relation to that. Okay, Ruby Blonya said, say, good evening. I asked a question about, okay, let me see Ruby. Ruben, I didn't, I've not seen your question though. Can you retype because I don't think you entered it because there is no question here from you apart from what I just read. So Ruben, please retype the question for me. Retype the question, I cannot see. Okay, so Charles Brenya said, thank you so much, sir. It's a pleasure, Charles. It's a pleasure. Okay, Ruben, you said it is lengthy. That's why. No, Ruben, there is no comment from you above because I see the comments in real time. So there is no comment above from you. Okay, Augustine also is asking, what happens if an overhead should specifically be stated as a variable cost? In that case, it should be a variable overhead. So because uh, like electricity bill, when we are using machine, the depreciation of the machine is irrelevant. I get it, it's irrelevant for us. But electricity expenses or maintenance of the machine, it's overhead. But those kind of overheads are going to be variable. Sorry, I'm going to be relevant over it in relation to that. So, Augustine, uh, if an overhead is stated as a variable cost, it has to be a relevant variable overhead, like maintenance, like um, uh, electricity. Then, in that case, yes, we can say it's a relevant cost. Ruben, I don't know if you are retyping your question because like I said, I didn't see your question. All comments are real time. So I see them, then I read. I see them, then I read. So I didn't see any comment from you about. So I don't know if you are retyping. If you can retype it, then I'll answer it for you in relation to that. Okay, so Augustine said, okay, you're welcome. Any other questions for those of you who are on Zoom? Sorry, <laughs> no one is on Zoom today. For those of you who are watching uh, uh, with me here, any other questions you put in a chat box? Rubin Blonya, I don't know if you are typing your question so that I can wait a little for you. So I answer that question, because if not, you may not get the principle well. I'm just trying to see if still a comment escapes me, but no comment has escaped me. Okay, so Rubin Blonya said, 
I will retype. I thought you were retyping all this while. Okay, I'm waiting for you. Right, so um, as I wait for Ruben's uh, question, uh, note that we are doing these sessions, like I say all the time, is to, to assist you in order for you to prepare for your examination very well. And last week, it's because of the responses that we had, uh, people were really uh, encouraged and were uh, really appreciative of uh, last week's executive uh, Q&A session that I did. And uh, it's be based on that, that's why I decided that we would also continue with that uh, session or with those sessions this week. But this is uh, an executive revision masterclass. So I'm going to be taking uh, the key topics, the key areas of various subjects, and then spend time on it and explain the principles and the concepts under each of them in relation to that. And today we've looked at relevant costing. The possibility of you seeing that in the exam hall is really, really something high. So you gotta make sure you understand the principles in relation to that. And also, like I say all the time, management accounting requires reading the question carefully, carefully. So you've gotta make sure you pay attention to the details and read the question carefully. Okay, so I see Ruben question back now. And then Augustine also said, does the principle as applied on the book value of the machine be applied on inventories too? Yes, that is why the sunk cost, that is the price at which we bought the inventory some time ago is irrelevant. Okay, so any book value or revalued amount of the inventory or whatever it is, is a sunk cost. As far as it is historical, it's a sunk cost in relation to that. So Augustine, uh, it applies to inventories the same way. So Ruben, if you are special, if you if a special skill is needed to execute a particular task in the organization, that task can be executed by a permanent employee. Okay. So Ruby, what is the question? So Ruby, what is the question? You said if a special skill is needed to execute a particular task in the organization, that task can be executed by a permanent employee. So what is your question, Ruby? That is a statement. If the task can be executed by a permanent employee, but that which is not part of his job discretion, okay. Go ahead, Ruby. So we need a special skill to execute a particular task in the organization, and that task can be executed by a permanent employee, but the task is not part of his job description. Okay, so what is your question now? Okay, so I see a comment from um, Richard Aj said, please, which day are we meeting again and time? Richard, definitely tomorrow we are going to be meeting. The time is still, um, how do we call it? 4.30 p.m. So it's still 4.30 p.m. So tomorrow we'll be meeting again and throughout the week we'll be meeting. Okay, so if you have not subscribed to the channel, you subscribe to the channel so that in case it escaped you and I even go live and you click the notification bell, 
so that in case it escapes you, when you have the notification bell on and I'm live, YouTube will send you the notification directly so you can get it and then you will join the stream. So definitely we'll meet tomorrow at the same time, 4.30 in that case. Rubin Blonya, I'm still waiting for your question. You've made two statements, but no question attached. So I don't know what you want me to say. Mustafa said, what is the impact of COVID-19 with respect to financial reporting standards as per IFRS? <laughs> okay, I'm coming to that question, Mustafa. So Blonya said, the extra cost which is paid to this employee can it be considered as relevant cost? Oh, okay. So Ruby, let me get your question here. You have an employee who is permanently employed. We need a skill and that skill, or we need a specialist to do a job. And that job can be done by this employee who is permanently employed, only that is not part of his job description. So yes, it's more or less like we are engaging a consultant. So if he is not doing that out of his spare time, then it will be a relevant cost. But if he has a spare time and out of his spare time, he is using it to do this job, then definitely it is going to be relevant. I believe you get an explanation, Ruben. So yes, he is permanently employed. It is not part of his job description. But if he is doing the new job out of uh, leisure time or out, out of ideal time or spare capacity on his existing job, then it is irrelevant. The money we will pay him is going to be irrelevant. But if he is fully occupied on his job and he is doing the new contract as an extra work, in that case, that money will give him will be a relevant cost in relation to that. So Ruben, that is the explanation to the statement. So it depends whether he has a spare time or not. If he has a spare time, then it is irrelevant. But if he has no spare time, then definitely it is relevant in relation to that. So Mustafa said, what is the impact of COVID-19 with respect to financial reporting standards as per IFRS. Yeah, currently uh, the International Accounting Standard Board is actually, or has actually published a, a documentation on the impact of COVID-19 on the financial reporting standard. So uh, you can Google that document and then get access to it in relation to that. Mustafa, COVID 19's impact on financial reporting not yet developed. Yes, it's not yet developed, but there are some uh, publications issued that you can read around it to see what is happening. So, Mustafa, you can just Google uh, financial reporting or the impact. That, that, that's the same question you put here. And then a document will come as a PDF file. You can download it and then you read through it to understand what is happening. But as to development of a standard to handle COVID-19 yet to be done, or if there is anything like that to be developed in relation to that. Because really, the issue about COVID-19 would have to look at uh, some things about how entities are going to be operating and certain expenses that they are going to be incurring now and how uh, they are going to be recognizing certain revenues in, in that case. So there will be just, there will be just a couple of um, uh, changes in the structure of the financial reporting. But like I said, you can download that document and you can read through it and uh, get it there in relation to that. So Ruby Blonya said, exactly my question. The explanation is clear. Sorry for keeping you waiting. Don't worry, I'm here because of you guys. So as far as I can wait for you to get the understanding, it's better for me that way. It is clear, say, all right, that is nice. 
great that it's clear for you now in relation to that. So we'll be meeting same time tomorrow, 4.30 p.m. And uh, we'll, be look, we'll be continuing with a relevant costing uh, decision and look at another key aspect as well in uh, short-term and the relevant costing. So possibly I'll be looking at the part two of relevant costing by solving a standard question with you tomorrow. Then we'll look at a shutdown decision making. So we'll look at some of the short-term decision making as well tomorrow because these are also critical areas that you have to understand uh, in money accounting in that case. So join me same time tomorrow as we continue with our discussion. Thank you very much, you guys, for joining the stream. It's always a pleasure to come your way. And uh, thank you for taking the time to study under my mentorship and allowing uh, our channel to be uh, an avenue where you study. We don't take it lightly at all for you guys taking time and then joining the stream. So Augustine, um, Richard, Seydou, Kawili, uh, Damilari, um, Charles, Rubin, uh, Mustafa, and all of you guys, all of you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that you take time to always watch and uh, also share the video with others and share the channel with your colleagues and your friends. We want to reach as much people as possible because like I always say, my objective is to be able to provide the assistance to you guys. I didn't get that assistance, but I made a commitment and I've made that commitment that I want to provide that assistance for you guys in relation to that. So let's share the content, let's share the channel to other people so that we invite them to also benefit from what we are doing. So together we can help as many as we can so we can get many people passing their exams, excelling and taking their life to the next level. If I'm successful, you are successful, your friends are also successful, it will reduce the burden that you will be having as an individual and that will take your life to the next level in relation to that. So Rubin Ploya said, I'm okay now. So the key point Right. So that is it about that. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna see you same time tomorrow, 4 30 p.m. as we continue with our discussion. Like I said, if you have not subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell icon and select all notifications. That way, when I go live, you'll be the first person to be notified so that you can join the stream and uh, study under my mentorship in relation to that. So thank you very much and I'll see you same time tomorrow.